Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for an exciting discussion about television drama and creation. As Rob said, on this evening, we're being blanketed with snow in New York City, and we're also seeing a silver lining to COVID because had this been an in-person talk, it would have been canceled. And it also wouldn't have been able to take place because Nicole Yorkin is based in LA. So we're gonna continue to have virtual talks like this uh, at the Princeton Club and in partnership with our co-sponsors, even when the world opens up again and we're able to be back together. So wonderful speakers like Nicole Yorkin can join us. And I'm delighted to have Nicole with me tonight to discuss how she first got the idea to make the hit Amazon series, Z, the beginning of everything about Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald. It was released in 2017 and she's gonna share with us what the journey was like to get it produced and streamed. We'll also hear from Nicole about her new Netflix show that's currently in production and she has some very, very interesting insights and information to share about the challenges of producing television shows during a pandemic. So the series Z is loosely based on Therese Ann Fowler's book, Z, a novel of, F. Scott, of Zelda Fitzgerald. And it's a fictionalized version of the Fitzgerald's lives and their passionate and tumultuous relationship. And we're going to discuss how much is an actual factual biography of these two individuals who are two of the liveliest, most flamboyant and creative literary figures of the 1920s flapper period. And we'll also be sharing clips from the series. Before we introduce Nicole, I again want to thank my co-hosts, Rob Welk, Pilar Castro-Klitz, and a special thank you to Anna Zuckerman Vitovenko, who helped arrange tonight's program. It's an honor to introduce Nicole Yorkin, who with her producing partner, Dawn Prestwich, is the co-creator showrunner for the terrific period drama we're discussing tonight, Z, the beginning of everything, as well as her new Netflix series, Hit and Run, which is a mystery thriller that she's working on right now. And we're gonna hear more about that as well. And Nicole and Dawn were previously writers and executive producers on all four seasons of AMC Netflix, The Killing. Other credits over a 30 year career include stints as writers and co-executive producers on Showtime's Brotherhood, for which they won a 2006 Peabody Award, HBO's Carnival and CBS's Chicago Hope. In 2003, they won a Writers Guild Award for their drama pilot, The Education of Max Bickford. And in 1997, Nicole shared an Emmy Award nomination with several producers of Chicago Hope in the category Outstanding Drama Series. As a journalist for the Los Angeles Herald Examiner at the beginning of her career, Nicole was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for her series about a 12 year old prostitute. So we are indeed honored to have Nicole with us tonight to talk both about Z and also about her illustrious career and her insights into producing and writing. So as Rob said, she'll speak for about an hour and I encourage you all, she has such amazing insights. Please share your questions in the Q&A tab and we'll get to as many as we can. So let's start with some background. Nicole, before we begin to talk about your show Z, I think our audience is gonna be interested in this amazing and diverse background you have. You started your career as a journalist after you graduated from Berkeley, you were a reporter for the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, whereas I said you were nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Can you tell us about the transition into TV and what you started when you began your, your TV career? Yes, and thank you, Wendy, and thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, well, I'll just say I came out of college, I became a reporter in Los Angeles during the late 70s and um, early 80s, which was a very exciting time. 
We had lots of, um, you know, John Belushi dying. We had lots of drugs and lots of LAPD mischief and um, lots of interesting stories. So I spent about six years writing about some of those stories. And then at a certain point, I thought, you know what, maybe some of these stories might lend themselves to either TV or film. In fact, the, the, the series that I, I got the Pulitzer Prize nomination for was about this 12 year old prostitute named Angel, that was her nickname. And somebody used that story as the basis for like a um, not very reputable movie called Angel Diary of a Teenage Hooker, which I had nothing to do with. And I thought, you know, I could, I could, I'd rather tell my own stories. So I applied to um, AFI, the American Film Institute, and um, got in as a writing fellow. And that's where I met my future partner, Dawn. And like you said, we've been together for 30 years, you know, trying to tell stories. And um, I would just say that it took us about four years after we graduated from AFI. We just wrote a bunch of spec scripts, which is what people do. And then finally, some crazy person took a chance on us and gave us a TV job um, and on a, a show called The Trials of Rosie O'Neill in the, I guess it was in the, the early 90s. And that's that was the beginning. So, so you've been working with Dawn for 30 years at least. And I'm really interested to understand what is that working relationship like? It's hard to work with anybody or partner with anyone for that long. How do you navigate the partnership? Well, I think it's like, as I always say, and somebody else said before me, it's kind of like a marriage without the sex because uh, it's so, you're, you spend 12 hours a day together, you know, on a good day, like when we were in when we go on the set, when we travel somewhere, we're together, we're in each other's presence. We've learned to write, you know, anywhere, anytime we write on the phone. We, we actually developed this system of writing that not all partnerships do, but I'm the one that always types it and Dawn sits on the couch and we talk it out loud. We sort of say it out loud. And um, so we, we've had screaming fights over the years. We've had, you know, fights that people could hear through the walls of, <laughs> you know, our writers building and things, but, but ultimately we learned that um, even though we're very different people, she's somebody who, who's a Texan, who's Presbyterian, who went to Stanford. So that's very different from me, a Jewish person from Los Angeles who went to Berkeley. We've, I think together we're um, better than, or we're the sum of our holes better than each half as writers at least, so. What, what a wonderful story. And it's a great lesson for all of us to really learn how to appreciate the differences and work together so the sum is greater than the parts. So you've got this amazing background where you took your experience in journalism and started telling stories via television. How has your experience in journalism informed your work in television and vice versa? Well, I think most importantly, I just rely a lot on um, research. I love I love research, and that's something obviously you have to do as a reporter. And so um, that's something that's important with sort of every project we've done. Um, I always find that truth is always more interesting than fiction in a lot of ways. And so if you go to the source or if you find books about whatever subject you're writing about, you're always going to find interesting facts that and interesting stories that you can sort of incorporate into your work so that's great and now let's take a look at z the beginning of everything so it's a fictionalized version of the iconic couple zelda and f scott fitzgerald and their lives but as nicole just said there's quite a bit of research that was done to really lend a strong air of reality to the story and the characters, which we'll be discussing in more detail later. I first heard about the show from my daughter, Samantha, and I'm very glad she told me about it because it is an amazingly terrific uh, and compelling series. So it's focused on American socialite and writer Zelda Sayre Fitzgerald, who's played by Christina Ricci, and it takes place in the 1920s. But before we go to the trailer, which I'm excited to show all of you, I'd actually like to share the synopsis of the series that Nicole and Dawn gave Amazon, 
when they were asking for material for marketing purposes after the series was filmed because no one could describe the show better or more eloquently than its creators. So they wrote, Z is a fictionalized bio series of the life of Zelda Sarah Fitzgerald, the brilliant, beautiful, and talented Southern Belle who became the original flapper and icon of the wild flamboyant jazz age in the 20s. Z starts from the moment Zelda meets the unpublished writer, F. Scott Fitzgerald in Montgomery, Alabama in 1918 and moves through their passionate, turbulent love affair and their marriage. Made in heaven, lived out in hell as the celebrity couple of their time. It will show us the alcoholism, adultery, and struggle with dashed dreams and mental illness that leads to Zelda's tragic, untimely end. Z dives into the fascinating life of a woman ahead of her time, an artist determined to establish her own identity in the tempestuous wake of a world famous husband. It is a modern take on one of the most notorious love stories of all time, played out in salons and speakeasies from Montgomery, Alabama to the Cote d'Azur. So with that terrific setup by Z's creators, let's take a look at the show's trailer. I'm Scott Fitzgerald. I believe this is my dance. Well, that depends on what you've got in that flask of yours. We can go anywhere and do anything we want. This place will forever be known as the place we met. What? Are your initials so much bigger than mine, Scott Fitzgerald? Three thousand copies sold in three days. This is how you arrive in New York City. We will. <laughs> he basically married the heroine of his story. You are a success. I will never let you fail. Those are my words from my letter. You use my words? You can take a swing at my ego. You can make a run for my crown. Even with an army of people, you ain't gonna take us down. One can't stay on top forever. May I introduce Mrs. Scott Fitzgerald? You can call me Zelda. Zelda! 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 Well, that's an amazing trailer and it really captures the beautiful cinematography, music and writing that you brought to Z. And it just makes me want to watch it again and again. How did you first get the idea to make Z, Nicole? Or how were you first brought onto the project for this Amazon series? Well, interestingly enough, it didn't come from us. Christina Ricci had optioned the book that you mentioned before by Teresa Fowler and was looking for somebody to um, adapt it for her. And she talked to me and my partner and I had always been an F. Scott Fitzgerald fan as long as I remember. And um, I think I told you that supposedly my name comes from, I'm named after Nicole Diver in Tender is the Night because my mother was also a Fitzgerald fan. So when the idea of um, doing a series about Zelda's life was presented to us, we thought this sounded really interesting. And we uh, met with Christina Ricci and her producing partner and pitched them a take on how to do the series. And so they bought it and Amazon went with it. And that's what happened. <laughs> It's terrific. And you're credited with being Z's creator, executive producer, as well as writer. And you're also, you've also referred to yourself as a showrunner of the series. What, what does this mean? And is there a difference between writing for television and writing for films? 
Yeah, I think um, there is a difference between writing for television and writing for films in that um, in films, and maybe this has changed somewhat, but mostly somebody writes a feature and attaches a director and then the director takes that thing and runs with it. But in television, it's a writer's medium in that um, as you rise through the ranks of being a writer, you end up being the person who runs shows. You hire the director, you're in charge of casting, you're in charge of all the scripts. And that's basically what a showrunner does. Um, you know, it's a, a word you do hear around these days and um, doesn't only mean you've created the show, but you can be a show creator and not be a showrunner. but it's sort of like being the CEO of a company and that you're the bottom line for all the decisions that are made. And, you know, the success and failure of the show sort of rests on your shoulders, more or less, and you get the blame. If something's wrong. <laughs> the buck stops here, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. And what was the journey like to get Z produced and streamed? Well, we, we wrote our script and interestingly, Don and I have spent our whole career writing our drama. We'd never written a half hour drama, but the person who was in charge of half hour dramas at or half hours at Amazon at the time, Joe Lewis said, I could see this as a half hour drama which we thought was really interesting. We're used to writing 53 pages, but instead we're writing you know, half that amount for a script. But Zelda and Scott had such an action-packed life, we thought that this would probably, the material would lend itself to doing it as a, a half hour. So we wrote the script. We, um, we found a director who is Tim Blake Nelson, who's a wonderful actor. If you guys have seen Watchmen or if you've seen um, a million movies this man's been and he's also a great director and we went to savannah georgia filmed the pilot um, in 2015 and the way amazon did it at the time was they would put all the pilots they would filmed up on their platform and they'd have people vote and you know audience members would watch it and vote on whether they liked it or not and then supposedly they would pick the ones that got the most votes to um you know, to actually become a series. So we did pretty well. And so they picked it up to series. And then that's when um, we, we started a writer's room. We hired writers to work on it and, you know, spent the next six months writing the 10 scripts that, you know, became the 10 episodes. And then um, after that, we went to then Savannah in New York City and filmed in 2017 mostly I think or 2016. So it's interesting because you actually filmed it in Savannah rather than Montgomery. Yes you know we've been to Montgomery which was so interesting research-wise because we got to go to the house that that F. Scott and Zelda had lived in for a while there and they have the F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum there which was fascinating but it's not very cinematic um, you know in terms of what we were looking for you know it doesn't look as much like 1918 as Savannah was able to look like 1918. So, so in the heat of summer, we filmed in Savannah with, which was an extremely hot experience. <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> and I can identify with you being a big Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald fan because I was between attending Princeton and living in Great Neck as Fitzgerald did. I'm a very big fan. So, the fact that you were named after Nicole Diver is really fascinating. And I, I'm interested to know, and I'm sure our audience is as well, what was most important to you to convey in this series? You mentioned to me that you really wanted to tell the story of Z from Zelda's perspective. How did this shape the storyline, the writing, the sets, et cetera? Well, I think, you know, up until then, um, or, I mean, there have been, there've been two major biographies of Zelda. There was the first one in the 70s, um, which was a great, a great biography. And then there's one more recently with Nance, um, Sally Klein wrote. And it sort of was revising the history that we all thought we knew about Zelda and Scott. And you always think, you know, crazy Zelda, dragged down Scott, you know, uh, drank with him, um, actually impaired, it impacted his work in a negative way. 
And we wanted to sort of turn that around, taking the biographies we had read and show that, um, you know, she was a brilliant woman who was sort of trapped by her time. Um, she obviously had mental illness at the time. Um, it was characterized as schizophrenia, but now it's commonly thought that she probably was bipolar. Um, but she was very, very intelligent. She was a real artist. She was a wonderful painter. She became an obsessive ballet dancer. And then she also wrote. And so we wanted to just shift the gaze from Scott to Zelda. And it's, you know, they were, they were so um, attached in so many ways. It wasn't as if um, one that they, he never stopped loving her, I think, even though he went off and had other relationships, as did she. But um, we just wanted to show things from her perspective. And so um, that's why we start with her, like the pilot is said in 1918, and it's all, it ends at the moment she meets Scott. So the whole first half hour is all about Zelda and Zelda's life and her family. And then taking it from there, it's really more her point of view than Scott's. And you mentioned to me that you didn't really use Therese Ann Fowler's book, See a Novel of Zelda Fitzgerald, which the story was based on for research because you thought it was soft truth, maybe hearkening back to your journalistic background, and you wanted to yes. inject more reality into the series. So how did you do your research? What sources did you use to really shed light on the characters of Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald and to stay true to their history? Well, like I said, we, we relied heavily on Sally Klein's wonderful biography of Zelda, which I recommend to anyone who's interested in her because unlike the previous biography, this biography actually includes all the, um, the mental institution and all the doctor's records that weren't in the, weren't, she wasn't allowed to use in the first biography. So it's, it's a very interesting history to read. We also um, read, everybody in the writer's room read a book called um, by Kendall Taylor called Sometimes Madness is Wisdom, which is about their actual relationship and their marriage. There's also the Matthew Bruckley biography, which I guess is considered the standard. And um, we also read Save Me the Waltz, which is Zelda's one novel, which is autobiographical and was helpful. And then we had various, you know, we had a couple of historians talk to us about the period. Um, and I think we watched a couple of documentaries, but we did try to, you know, base everything in in reality as much as we we could. <laughs> and where did you take creative liberties? What what did you change and why? Well, like I said, I, I think there was a kernel of truth in almost everything we used we did in the show or we showed in the show. But um, like for instance, I know if you've seen it, there's a moment where Zelda appears naked. Um, you know, in front of all the party goers on her wedding night, sort of as a, a way to get them all to leave so she can finally have her husband to herself. And as far as we know, that didn't necessarily happen. However, um, she and Scott were sort of notorious for hosting parties, uh, drunken parties where somebody ended up naked and often it might've been Scott, I mean, it might've been Zelda. So we felt um, dramatically we could, you know, we could use this moment um, to say something about Zelda. So we usually only change things for dramatic impact or storytelling purposes, you know? And, and it's interesting, that particular scene was, I, I thought it was very dramatic because usually if you saw a woman in a scene like that naked, it would be somewhat gratuitous and she could be perceived as a sexual object. But the way you wrote it and the way you presented it, it was really a sign of Zelda's, Zelda's strength and her independence. And that's what we wanted it to be. So I'm glad it came across that way. And that was very much what Christina Ricci wanted it to be. You know, she um, she's not someone who goes around being naked in films or a lot, but in this case, she really felt it was important to make that statement. So, yeah. okay. So I'd love to get started on some of our clips. So we're going to start with the scene early on after Scott and Zelda first meet. Uh, as we've talked about when we first meet Zelda, she's Zelda Sayre. She's living a privileged life 
in Montgomery, Alabama during World War I. And she meets Scott, an aspiring writer who barely avoids being shipped, shipped off to fight thanks to the armistice. Nicole, can you set up this first scene for us? Sure. So Zelda and Scott supposedly met at an officer's dance at her Montgomery um, Country Club. And that night, Zelda actually performed a dance in front of the crowd, um, a, ball a ballet dance, and met Scott. And it wasn't ne necessarily love at first sight on her, her part, but he was pretty smitten with her because she was notoriously beautiful. And everybody always says the pictures don't do her justice. And I think that's true. Um, you can't even, you can't see the golden light that supposedly, you know, was emanating from inside of her. But um, so he asked her for a date and she replied, I never make late dates with fast workers. So uh, instead she gave him her phone number and he promptly, and then promptly ignored his many phone calls. So um, this is after that, after he's been calling for a while and she has not responded. There's a new picture at the Strand. Oh, no, I've seen it three times. We haven't been to the arcade for a while. You see her? Oh, what? Uh-oh. Oh, Lord. Oh, now, don't get off my bed. Shut up. You see her? Why? Lieutenant Fitzgerald. What in heaven's name are you doing here? Well, I thought you'd be off doing military maneuvers or something. What brings you to town? Well, I'm looking for you. Oh, seems you found me. I don't imagine I've took to thing for that. Libby Hart, this is Lieutenant Scott Fitzgerald. How do you do? Well, much better now that I've found the elusive and safe. I'm hardly elusive. But life can be so awfully distracting. In fact, I'm surprised you even have a moment to chat with us, given how busy you must be with all that writing of yours. Mr. Fitzgerald's going to be a famous writer someday. Really? Well, I would be rewriting my novel right now, but I can't finish it because I find myself inordinately concerned with your phone line, Miss Sayers. No matter how many times I call, somehow I can't seem to find you in. Sounds like the problem's not the phone line. What were you calling about anyway? I know that you're uh, quite sought after. But I'm not going to be stationed here forever. And I need to get to know you better. Well... What are you doing tonight? This is such a great scene. And clearly <laughs> Zelda's a true Southern belle with a big dose of independence. And I, I understand that you wanted to convey this idea, this joint idea of feminism and independence. How did you really get the reference to do the writing for this character development? Well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, Somebody early on said that that um, th this couple, Scott and Zelda, were sort of the 1920s embodiment of sort of Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love. You know, they were somebody who were the the celebrity, um, the amazing celebrity couple of their time. And Zelda, um, she was a woman whose talent and, and intellect and energy should have made her a brilliant success as something. But she lived in a time when married women were expected to be, you know, no more than wives and mothers. And so um, when you read the books about her, you see that she, um, she was very frustrated by the limitations that were put in front of her. And so we thought we would um, sort of take that and run with it because it's not something that's um, unusual for, you know, women today even to feel the same kind of frustration, even though we have more opportunities than she did then. So. And there are a lot of examples in the show where she's offered a part in a movie, but she doesn't take it because Scott doesn't want her to. And there also, you also had a focus in the series on Scott using some of Zelda's diary entries. So I, I had actually, chatted with Charles Scribner III, whose family was responsible for publishing Fitzgerald's works. And I asked him to watch Z, Z and to share his thoughts. He said to congratulate you. He really enjoyed watching the show, especially the bubble bath scene and the scenes at Princeton. <laughs> and he commented that Z was more faithful to the Fitzgerald than the crown is to the Windsors. And I, I also asked him about Zelda's writing because I hadn't heard before about Scott using Zelda's writing. 
So he wrote that he had commissioned Zelda's writings from a scholar 30 years ago who had said, and, and here's how, how he commented on it. He said, Zelda had some raw and winsome talent, indeed a voice of her own, but Scott was the artist. If he used some material from her Westport journals, it was daily straw that he spun into literary gold. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I do have, I do have a few thoughts about that because I think um, I would say that that's sort of the more conventional perspective on Zelda's writing. I mean, he actually did use her letters and her diary from early on, not necessarily in Westport, but before that when they were in um, you know, the city in 1920. And he, of course, drew on her life. And he drew on her as a character in um, The Side of Paradise. And then their, his next book was basically about their marriage. And he, um, you know, he used a lot of the things that she said or wrote and didn't necessarily ever attribute um, it to, to Zelda. So that's why, you know, it doesn't, it's not that well known that she was such a good writer. But one thing I was, I think I mentioned to you, Wendy, is that um, later on when she was trying to draw on her own experience with madness, because she'd been in, in and out of mental hospitals, you know, since she was about 30 years old, um, she decided that she wanted to write an, a novel about it. And Scott was furious about it because he was in the process of trying to write and had been meant years and years of trying to write Tender as a Night. And so I thought I would read a little passage from the Sally Klein biography, which is interesting, is that, um, and this is part of it, this is, comes from the transcripts when Scott and Zelda were talking to one of the psychiatrists at um, the, one of the hospitals Zelda was in. And he says, Scott said, I don't want you to write a novel about insanity because you know there is certain psychiatric stuff in my books and if you publish a book before me, or even at the same time in which the subject of psychiatry is taken up, and people see Fitzgerald, why that is Scott Fitzgerald's wife, they read that, and that spoils the whole central point of being a novelist, which is being yourself. You pick up the crumbs I drop at the dinner table and stick them in books. And then she said, well, you have picked up crumbs I have dropped for 10 years too. But he was reluctant to acknowledge, uh, you know, or even allow her to publish that book and that became her book, um, Save Me the Waltz, which he then supposedly heavily edited. And so, you know, nobody knows what the original version of it looked like. But so I think, um, I think who knows what she could have been if she had not been mentally ill and if she had more of an opportunity to, you know, be her own writer, I guess. Yeah, and if women had more opportunities at that point in time too. Thank you for sharing that. That was really fascinating to hear. So as, as we've learned over the years, the newly married Fitzgeralds really rode the success of this side of paradise, which was published by Scribner's in 1920. And there are endless shots in the series of one or both <laughs> drinking from a bottle, imbibing in bathtubs and so on really navigating the party circuit in New York and elsewhere. There's definitely a lot of self-indulgence among this couple who lived a flamboyant lifestyle and were really celebrities of their time. So there's a lot going on in this fast moving series and character development is, is key. How did you capture it all in a, in a 30 minute episode? Well, I think, in general, not just this series, we always look at story as a way to eliminate character because the character is what you know is most important to us and it, what it will ultimately be most interesting to an audience. So um, we would find we tried to look at the reality of what their story was and then find ways to eliminate who we thought the characters were. So, for instance, in the beginning of our our pilot. Zelda strips naked and dives into a lake in 1918, Alabama, which tells us a lot about who this young woman is. She's brash and brave and defiant. And we try to find you know, other moments and other um, things, they, scenes, other actions that can help us um, and help the audience figure out who these characters are. And the next two clips we're going to see involve Princeton. 
even though he didn't actually graduate from Princeton because F. Scott Fitzgerald went into the army, he is, as Rob noted earlier, an iconic figure in Princeton's legacy. So for those of us who went to Princeton, we know that Z wasn't shot at Princeton, although you did an amazing job at replicating Princeton's Gothic halls. So I, it would be interesting for the audience to hear with what you shared with me about why you didn't actually film at Princeton, where you did film the Princeton scenes, and also where you filmed the cottage club scenes, the eating club that Scott belonged to at Princeton, because it <laughs> sure looked a lot like cottage club. Wow. Well. We would have gone to Princeton, except for we were getting um, the tax credit from New York State, which meant that we had to contain our filming to New York City, or, or New York State, rather. And that's why we couldn't go to New Jersey and go to Princeton. So it was all about the dollar for Amazon. And so our production designer, Hen Henry Dunn, who's a wonderful um, artist in his own right, he tried to replicate the look of Princeton as much as he could, you know, through his research. So we shot some of it, the scene you're about to see, I believe, at Union Theological Seminary, which is on the Upper West Side um, in Manhattan. And then he filmed the Cottage Club at a place called the Webb Institute, which is out on Long Island. So. Okay, so we, we've got two clips about Princeton and we're gonna show the first of the clips, which shows the, the Fitzgeralds and some of their Princeton pals arriving at Princeton for Scott to give a talk about his new book, This Side of Paradise, which sold 20,000 copies in its first two weeks. Can you set up the scene for us, Nicole? Sure. Um, so in 1920, Scott, was, Scott and Zelda were actually invited to come to Cottage and be chaperones for a weekend. Um, at the at, at Princeton and Scott was very excited to get back to Princeton to show off his beautiful wife and to sort of bathe in the success of his his novel so they went back there determined to shock everybody which they did and he ended up with two black eyes and um, he got banned from cottage after that and um, it was a little bit of a debacle but he had hoped that he would come home as the returning hero, but you'll see what happens. <laughs> Didn't happen that way. Oh, there were women. They just weren't students. <laughs> so let me guess, Lawrence, your father was a Princeton man too. I'm third generation, mm -hmm. both grandfathers. And I take it the money's not gonna run out anytime soon? I suppose not. See, this is the rub. The truly rich never have to worry about it all getting away from them. I don't know what you're talking about, Goofo. You're the best-selling author of the year. No one's taking that away from you. Lawrence, tell us what you like most about Scott's book. Well, uh, it captures youth mm -hmm. and rebellion. Hmm. And it takes a hatchet to everything else, unlike all the books they make us read here. Here, here. I made myself a summer reading list. Mackenzie, Wells, all the authors Professor Bailey said you borrowed from. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I no, didn't mean No, no, no. Lawrence, yeah. every first novel uh, displays the author's influence. Yes, so what's important is his second book, which the author must make entirely his own. Right, Scott? Absolutely. Tell us about your second book, Scott. Tell us about your first book, Bunny. <laughs> Scott, let's go to the bookstore. I want to see the display. Give Bunny something to fantasize about. Going back, going back, going back to Nassau Hall. Going back, going back to the best old place of all. <laughs> so those of us who went to Princeton know the song they were singing going back to old Nassau very well. And you've also captured a wonderful feeling that many of us alumni feel when we go back to Princeton. How did you find this song and the other wonderful music throughout the series that really evokes Princeton and this period of time? Well, we you know we did some research. This 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 episode that takes place at Princeton was actually written by a man named Doug Dorst, who's a novelist who was on our staff at the time. And 
also does a lot of research and read everything about Scott and and you know found out that this is this is the song the Princeton um, theme song I guess and um, so we used that's that's why that's in there but we also had a wonderful music supervisor who um, would come up with you know so songs from the period that we would then play and try to um, you know incorporate into the show whenever we could we also had a composer but um, the needle drops are what are, are really cool I think the music was so cool at the time. The music is amazing. I loved it. I love listening to all of it. Um, and so this side of Paradise was published. And my understanding is that some at Princeton were a bit upset at Fitzgerald's description of Princeton as a country club. So as you mentioned in the Series Z, Scott receives an invitation to speak at Princeton. He's really excited about the opportunity to show come back show his beautiful wife, show his success, but it doesn't turn out exactly as planned. Do you want to set up this clip for us, Nicole? Yeah. So, so he didn't actually, he was not actually um, brought back to make a speech at Princeton. However, a few years later, he did reach out to Dean Gauss, who's the character we'll see in this show, and suggested, he, Fitzgerald suggested that he give a series of formal lectures at Princeton, and he promised not to be drunk during them. Um, but unfortunately, the invitation never came. So this was a bit of dramatic license where, um, print, where Scott's had a pretty bad time at Princeton so far, is a little bit drunk, and it's time for him to give his speech before the crowd. Yeah. Should we wait for the rest of the department? Oh, oh no, I believe we're all here. There's a baseball game this afternoon. I wrote. I wrote this novel, but it's not a book that any of you will ever assign or value or even understand. No book of mine will ever be. And all the writing I've done and will do is in spite of you. You teach with two goals. To prop up literature that is long dead and to curry favor with the wealthiest students just so you can indulge in the fantasy that you belong to their world. You don't. You never really said in here, did he? Not like he wanted to. You're not a part of anyone's success. Most certainly not mine. You are fools and eunuchs, and you are pathetic, tragic frauds. <laughs> Sit down! I'm not finished. Heaton, Bailey, Grimshaw, you will never Mr. breakfast Fitzgerald. with the Firestones or find yourself parting the fleshy thighs of the Widow Campbell. So sorry. Oh, no, we are absolutely not sorry. All right, Fitz, set them straight. I can move on. Scott. Can you take him back to cottage? Scott. Lovell and I will try to repair the damage here. He's under tremendous pressure, sir. He wants us so desperately to please everyone. He was too soon to admit that. What a devastating end to a talk that was supposed to really herald F. Scott Fitzgerald's success at Princeton. So it's interesting. In an interview, Christina Ricci, who we know played Zelda, commented that Scott's initial fame after this side of paradise became like a drug that Scott and Zelda chased for the rest of their lives. And it's really sad and surprising when you think that F. Scott Fitzgerald didn't really achieve fame as one of the greatest American writers of our 
time until after his death. And as one interesting example, Princeton initially rejected his daughter uh, Scotty's uh, offer to give Scott's papers to the library. Uh, but then they accepted it later, and now they're among Princeton's most widely consulted holdings. So what are your, your thought of, thoughts about his posthumous celebrity and, and the sad reality that what, during his life he wasn't appreciated for the work that he created, as was Zelda was in this well? You're on mute, Nicole. <laughs> he was pretty much known for um, you know, being an incredible drunk and um, alienating everybody who sort of um, walked through, walked in his path or walked across his path rather. And I think, you know, even by the 50s, nobody was reading him anymore. You know, um, he was just considered sort of a, a really dead author and not very well appreciated, which is amazing given the fact that a lot of people think The Great Gatsby is the classic American novel. Um, and it's sad, he, he, he was a very difficult person. He alienated a lot of his friends. His drinking was unbelievable. Um, I mean, I've, there are actually papers that have been done. I saw one by the Journal of the American Medical Association about his alcoholism, because it was, you know, a textbook example of somebody who just, you know, he died, I think, at age 44, I believe, um, from a heart attack, and he was so ill because of his drinking. Um, so it's it's sad, you know, and luckily his, his reputation has been revived. I heard he even got a degree from Princeton posthumously, maybe in 2017. Oh, I didn't even yeah. hear. <laughs> I, I think so. Honorary degree. Yeah. So, so on a brighter note, I love the next clip we're going to show because it really illustrates Zelda and Scott's independence and also shows them having a little fun. Can you set up the clip yeah. for us? Yes. Yeah. So in July um, of 1920, they decided they'd been living in Westport. Zelda was really sick of it and she wanted to go back to Montgomery and see her family. She wanted to go to the South. And um, they decided to take a road trip from Westport to Montgomery. And he later wrote a little travel series about it called The Cruise of the Rolling Junk, because they had lots of adventures along the way. Um, and so this incident that's in this next scene supposedly took place in Virginia. like a room. Where are you folks from? New York City. New York City. Well, on our way to Montgomery. Oh, I like your bulldog, mister. We're sold out tonight. Sold out? But there's clearly no one here. No vacancy. There aren't any motor cars parked outside. We got a dress code here, and she's breaking it. She doesn't like my knickerbockers. <sighs> Pity a nice girl like you should be let to wear them kind of clothes. And exactly what kind of clothing should a nice girl be wearing, in your opinion? Floyd, seeing as you're clearly a man of sartorial flair. Don't know what you're trying to say, fancy pants. What but clothing I... should my wife be wearing? Scott, let's just go. No, I am tired and hungry. You would like to take a bath, and we would like to get a room. Not my problem. I ain't renting a room to some Yankee bed bunny. Now. You're totally my wife. Hey, hey mister, you don't want me wearing these pants in your hotel? How about now? You gonna rent us a room now? I'm called a sheriff. <gasps> we better scram. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I 
I love this scene because it really shows how independent they were, how much spunk Zelda had. Is, is it also kind of a statement about the times and about feminism? And uh, I'd love to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, supposedly that did happen that you know, when as they were traveling through the South and through other parts of the country, people didn't like to see a woman wearing pants or knickerbockers. And um, Zelda just didn't give a damn what they thought or what they wanted. And um, she just herself, like sort of defiantly herself, most of her life, which is what made her such a great character. You know? Well, I, I heartily encourage anybody who has not yet seen the series to watch it. And I'm going to be watching it again and again because it's really wonderful. And now I'd love to get into your career and what's next for you, Nicole. So you mentioned that you're headed to Israel in January, hopefully, for a new $100 million show called Hit and Run. Can you tell us a little about it and about how you started work last year before COVID hit? Yes, it's a um, it's a mystery thriller, like you said before. It's um, if anybody has seen that, there's an Israeli show called Fauda, and so my partner Don and I created the show with the two people who created the Israeli show Fauda, and it also and one of those creators happens to be the star of Fauda, Lior Roz who's um, sort of an, an unusual, um, he's not what you'd expect to be a sex symbol, but he's become kind of a sex symbol and he's also um, a, a, an action hero and a good actor. So we came up with the idea for a, a show that starts in Israel with, um, he plays an Israeli guy who's a tour guide, his wife's a dancer with a, their preeminent modern dance company there, but she's an American. And she's on her way home to New York to audition for a dance company, another dance company. And um, she's on her way to the airport in Tel Aviv and stops for a coffee. And on her way back to her taxi cab, she's hit by a car and killed. Hence the title, Hit and Run. And at first, it looks like an accident. But of course, it doesn't end up being an accident. And so um, about a year ago, a year ago, um, August, we went to New York and we filmed in New York for five months. And then last January, we went to Tel Aviv and we're filming, you know, happily filming in Tel Aviv until COVID hit, in which case, um, like on a dime, Netflix had to fly all the foreign nationals out of there because we had a Israeli cast, an Israeli crew, Israeli and American crew. And then we had people from all over the world working on it. And so We've been trying to get back ever since, but it's been a little rough given, um, you know, COVID, but we're supposed to be going January 5th. So, and we just have about a month left of shooting and hopefully we'll do that. <laughs> we'll get and it done. Can, so, so you've got another month left of filming, but I, as I understand from you, there are a lot of parameters that you need to follow. What are the challenges of producing television shows during the pandemic. What have you got to deal with when you go back to Israel? And how are your days now different than they were before doing the show production remotely? Well, um, there are each studio and each network has their own COVID protocols. And Netflix has about a 40 page document that lists all of their protocols for filming, basically. And there's things like, um, there's a different zones. So the zone that's called the red zone, which is where the actors are, because the actors will be, you know, obviously acting without masks on, which puts them more at risk. So everybody um, in their circle, which would be like the director of photography, the director, you know, all the necessary crew members, all of us will have to be tested about three times a week. And, um, you know, we obviously have to wear all PPE all the time and um, they'll be wearing PPE until we start filming, then they'll take it off and um, all the rest of the people working on the production will be tested about once a week. And just, you know, there's all sorts of changes that things that we've never seen before in 30 years, I've never seen before. There's, you know, craft services table, usually a table with, with food to eat when you're hungry and of course, we can't have people walking over and everybody's hands going into the food. So everything has to be packaged individually. And, um, 
you know, there, there are literally 40 people who will be working on the COVID pro protocols for our show in Israel, just to make sure that nobody gets sick and hopefully knock on wood, nobody will. So does this wreak havoc with the bu budget? It actually does. It, it, it bumps the budget way up having to do all these COVID protocols and we can't shoot as long a day. Usually we shoot 12 hour days and I think we're shooting 10 hour days now because people get tired. Things take longer because of all of the, you know, these protocols and, um, you know, every day we can't control what people do off the set. All we can do is control what people do on the set. So supposedly the sets will be incredibly safe, but if somebody wants to go out after, you know, after work and go out to dinner with a friend at a bar, you know, we can't control that. And that's, that's what the worry is really, is just what people, you know, we have to sort of encourage everybody um, to do what's best for the community of the show and not just, you know, go off and party themselves because that will affect everybody ultimately. It's really a microcosm of all our world right now, relying on other people to be safe, to keep everybody else safe. Exactly. So we now have a, a female as vice president elect and the entertainment world has been discussing the need for more women as directors, producers, et cetera. It seems like we're seeing an explosion of female producers. Can you speak a bit about what your journey has been like and what you're, you see looking ahead. And then we're gonna go to audience questions. So if you sure. haven't yet put in your questions in the Q&A, please do now. Thank you. Well, when I started, when we started 30 years ago, we were always the only female you know, on staff. I mean, Don and I, we're, we, it's funny when you're a writing partnership in TV, you're considered one person, they pay you as one person, which is just an interesting sideline, even though you're two brains. So we were always the only women on every show we were ever on because there was usually only one woman on every show. And um, in those 30 years, it's gotten slightly better. You know, I'd say that 25% of the members of writing staffs now are women, which still isn't, you know, that great a number and of course it's been much worse for people of color so um you know with the the me too movement and with black lives matter that is now starting to finally change um and people are you know diversity and inclusivity is uh a big force now in our our business i'm in i'm a board member of the writers guild and we have spent the last year really really looking at that and coming up with programs to include, to increase the amount of diversity, you know, all over the business, you know, not only writers rooms, but writers assistants and obviously directors and producers as well. So there are many more people, uh, women and people of color now, but it's still, there's no parity at the moment, you know. Well, it's certain it's something to aspire for in, in many industries and certainly in the entertainment industry. So now we're going to go to our audience questions. Thank you very much for sending in uh, some really great questions. The first one is about the character of Vincent, which is Edna St. Vincent Millay, the poet. And uh, William writes, I'm a huge fan of the show. I've watched it twice through. Wow. and some episodes multiple times, the character Vincent really stands out to me. As the Gen Z say, she lives rent-free in my mind. What <laughs> went into creating this vivid character with all her haughtiness? I'm curious if you have a personal feeling about her. You know, what was so fun about doing this series, especially the part that's in New York, is all these amazing characters that i mean they're, they're real people who exist at the time who are friends of the fitzgeralds including um edna st vincent malay and Tallulah bankhead and bunny wilson and all these people and so she was such an amazing free spirit and she was so edna st uh, edna st vincent malay was so um she was the darling another darling of new york city at the time and so we just thought it would be she'd be a great character to include in the show, you know, and um, I think Zelda was a little intimidated by her um, from our research, but she was, she was just so interesting. We had to include her. 
Yeah, you had so many wonderful characters developed in the series. It was terrific to watch. We have another question from Jill Barron, who I think you know, and she wonders if the mental illness came about after they were married or if it happened, I think I somehow I've lost, there we go, came about after they were married and if that possibly came about because she felt so suppressed in the relationship Jill is actually a physician, and she wonders if there's any mention of that in Sally Klein's book. You know, there is a lot, a lot about, I mean, it's worth reading because the, the parts about her mental illness are so interesting. And um, she says that, that a lot of people um, would talk about pressured speech, like Zelda's pressured speech, and her, she had a very unusual speech pattern. But then Sally Klein points out, but this is all said in hindsight, you know, after knowing that the woman was hospitalized in mental institutions for years. Um, so it's hard to know whether it was there in the beginning or whether she was just sort of a wild and crazy free spirit that, um, and you know, then it eventually turned into something else. I guess she did have some mental illness in the family. There were a couple of suicides of her, um, I think her, her aunts and uncles or an aunt and uncle killed themselves. So there was probably some depression there too. And um, yeah, I, I think the kind of control that Scott tried to exert over her in many instances probably didn't help that process either at all, you know? So um, yeah, I, the, it's only went one year, the show only went one year, but luckily it was the year when they had some fun because after this year, it did get, their story got increasingly darker, you know, with her mental illness, his alcoholism, um, you know, their relationship was fraught in a lot of ways. So we got to have fun. Next, we have a question about hit and run. And uh, the person writing the question actually wrote their undergraduate thesis at Princeton on the Bathsheba Dance Company. And they wonder, since you mentioned that the victim of the crime is a dancer at the preeminent modern dance company in Israel, whether that was Bathsheba. That was indeed Bathsheba. And a, you know, only a Princeton audience would have somebody in it who would know that about <laughs> what the preeminent modern dance company was. And, and they, we, yeah, which is amazing. And we actually, um, our actress who plays our dancer actually got to train with Bathsheba for months and Ohad Naharin, who's, who wasn't the founder, but he's like the guiding force in, in Bathsheba, actually agreed to work with us. So we have the company in the show and, um, and we have you know, dancers in the show and the actual, the, the show starts with a performance at Bathsheba. And so we became very familiar with um, you know, Bathsheba and Ohad and everybody there it was such an amazing, um, just joy to be able to work with these dancers and you know it, it's a great company if you've never seen it see them <laughs> see them next time they come around to your your city and we'll also look forward to seeing it in your series so what was it like writing about these dancers well you know a million years ago i used to dance myself and so uh you know, not in any professional way, but I just love dancing. And, and um, so the idea of having this main character be a dancer um, was interesting. And the dance, the dance plays a part as, as um, the show moves to New York. There, we also, we filmed at Alvin Ailey. We, we, we give, I think we filmed at Paul Taylor Company. So there is sort of a dance thematic in this show, which is, is a really fun part of it, I think. So it's like being a journalist. You have to really be skilled and, and able to write about a very diverse range of topics. Exactly, exactly. You become an expert in so many, you know, every time you do a show, like we did Brotherhood and then I became an expert on the Irish mob for a while, you know, or you do Carnival and you start looking at Carnival sideshows and what freaks were like in the 30s, freaks were like in the 30s. And yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of weird knowledge in my brain. We have an interesting question about the writing process and whether that's different if you're pitching to streaming services like Amazon or Netflix versus traditional networks. Yeah, I, I believe it is very different. Um, we, 
when Don and I started, there was only network TV. And, you know, the way you differentiate what type of writer you are would be, you'd be either like an eight o'clock writer or a 10 o'clock writer, which, and in those days, the 10 o'clock shows were, you know, more adult. And so if you wanted to write more mature stuff or a little more sophisticated, you'd write 10 o'clock material. Um, now, you know, um, I, I would never honestly go back to network TV because they are, there's so many restrictions and there's so much involvement from um, executives in sort of a negative way. I mean, they're not all that way, but, you know, the people at Netflix, for instance, really do consider themselves your partners. And it's not that they don't give you notes, but, you know, we get a lot of notes and we have a lot of involvement with you know, our, our executives, but um, it just, it's not always trying to play to the um, lowest common denominator, which is a lot of what we found when we were doing network TV. You know, I'm sure there are great shows in between everything, but I think it's a lot harder to write for network TV in terms of creativity. You know? Thank you for those interesting insights. I hadn't realized that. So we have a question from Joe Quinn and he says that writers spend a lot of time staring at a right at a blank page, which is not an inherently dramatic thing to watch. So he asked whether you were concerned about how to portray Zelda and Scott's literary creativity while showcasing the flamboyance and tragedy of their personal lives. Well, that is hard because, and that's why um, there haven't been that many great shows about journalists either, because it's 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 sort of inherently passive, like a passive act. So luckily for, you know, if you had to watch a show about somebody who was just trying to write um, all the time, it might not be that interesting, but there's so much else happening around them that, so we deal a lot with like writer's block, which Scott was famously like had a problem getting started. And um, we have some voice over too that, that I think helps some of those moments when he's just trying to write, you know, so that it's not just a boring act of watching somebody sitting there with a piece of paper. And, um, you know, you just sort of find little tricks to, to uh, and you deal with what's going on around the writing usually. And I think, you know, that made it more interesting, hopefully. And you really did a brilliant job capturing that. Next, we have a question from Pilar Castro Kiltz, who is the head of Princeton Arts Alumni, one of our co-sponsors this evening. And she asks, when fictionalizing or adding fictional or imagined elements to biographic material, are there guiding principles or concepts that consistently help you navigate that line between fact and fiction? No, I think, that's a really good question. We we tried to remain true to the characters we're writing about. You know, um, we, like I said, we didn't always, not everything in this series actually happened to them, but we would find something that was close enough to it and then maybe we would heighten it a bit. But we never want to betray who the characters really are. And I think that's what you, you have to be focused on. and. In our case, we didn't mind if we sometimes made Scott look worse than Zelda because like we said, it's from Zelda's, more from Zelda's point of view. Um, but we did try to, to be fair to both of them and, you know, um, and not just make things up out of whole cloth if we, if we didn't have to. If that so it, it, it's kind of like the concept of augmented reality, right? And as opposed to uh, VR or virtual reality. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> so Anna Zuckerman, to whom we really owe tonight's event, she's your childhood friend and really helped organize this talk tonight. So we're very thankful for that. Anna has asked, did you always want to write and produce films or series, or was this an idea that evolved over time after you began as a journalist? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Anna. And hi, hi, Anna. I can't see you, but <laughs> Anna and I grew up four doors away from each other. So, um, you know, I I had a my dad was in the the entertainment business, and so um, he was in TV and films, and because of that. 
I really tried to avoid it for a long time. And I think, you know, I always wanted to write. I was always writing one way or the other. And I thought I'll avoid the industry and just go into journalism, which I really liked a lot. But then ultimately I found myself drawn into the business, even though I tried to avoid it because I didn't want to, um, you know, have to either be in my dad's shadow or I didn't want to have to rely on him for any help or anything. So um, it took me a while to get to get there. <laughs> I had to go through one career and then finally decide, okay, I'm going to try to go to film school and see where that leads me. And then I ended up here. You know. That's terrific. And I, I hope you don't mind sharing. So, so Nicole's father uh, is Bud Yorkin, who had an amazing career. And uh, it's wonderful to see Nicole following in and building her own footsteps uh, in the entertainment industry. Now we have a question from Chris, who, who thanks you for doing this and says that, um, that they're a DP and an AFI grad. Oh. They've interviewed for Netflix and Amazon shows recently, but haven't landed one as yet. Wondering how you go about finding key crew for your shows, and they'd love to hear any tips you might have for prospective cinematographers when interviewing. Wow. Well, you know, you're nowhere without a great cinematographer. So um, <laughs> I'm very indebted to all the cin cinematographers we've ever worked with. You know, and so Chris is obviously somebody who um, is, a, they're real artists and, you know, they're the ones who are responsible for, for creating the, the vision of what a show ends up being. Um, you know, oftentimes I find it comes from the director, like in the case of Hit and Run, our directing producer was the directing producer on Handmaid's Tale. He's a guy named Mike Barker, who also, um, directed a few episodes of Z, actually. He directed the second, third, and the last episode of Z. And Mike had worked with this wonderful young cinematographer um, named Zoe White um, on Handmaid's Tale. And so when we asked him to come and work on Hit and Run, he said, you know, I'd love to bring this, this woman in. She's, she's young, she hasn't had as much experience as some other people, but I think she'd do an amazing job. And so, um, so often we defer to the directors on that, you know, um, or um, because they might have a vision for how they want the show to look more than we as writers would. So, uh, but I, you know, it's I know it's hard out there, but there is a lot of content being made, as you guys, as we've all spent many hours, you know, streaming shows during the pandemic. So, um, you know, I just just try to. You know, sometimes we have DPs who fill in for people, like when people aren't there for a day or two. And any way you can sort of get your foot in the door, obviously, that's. that's so, you... so, yeah, clearly there's a lot of us streaming shows during the pandemic. I'm curious, what are some of your favorite shows that you've been streaming? Well, I, I love to watch mostly foreign shows for some reason. <laughs> So I've, I loved Babylon Berlin. I don't know if you guys have, if some of you have watched Babylon Berlin, um, but that's a fantastic show and a beautiful looking show too. That's set during the years before um, the rise of Hitler in, in Germany. Um, then there's another show called Line of Duty, which I think it's one of the best police dramas ever made. It's a British show. I think there are five seasons and if you haven't seen that, Please watch that because it's it's an it's the same guy who wrote Bodyguard. If any of you saw Bodyguard on Netflix, this guy Jen Mercurio, who's an amazing writer. So I like those. And I just watched. I think it's called Belgravia, which is um, by Julian Fellows, who did Down Abbey, and it said it's a like a six episode series that said a little bit like 1830, and it was a nice to get out of our current time and not think about COVID for a minute. So I enjoyed that. So those are my most recent ones. <laughs> hey, thank you. I, I made a list. <laughs> um, and in the shows that you've worked on, um, I'm sure there are some amazing moments when everything seems to come together and really surpasses your expectations. And then other moments when things 
just seemed to fall off the rails. Can you share your thoughts about both, whether during Z or other shows you've worked on? Yeah, I think um, I maybe shared with you, Wendy, that Christina Ricci was not an easy actress to work with. And so, um, you know, that makes it harder when you have to do a series with someone who, you know, is a little more difficult than somebody else might be. And, you know, but despite that, you have to do your work, obviously. You just know, you know, they might not make it any easier for you, which she certainly did not do. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that's just what we have to deal with. I always say that if somebody has a reputation, they probably earned it for a reason, you know, and you should listen. We have to listen to people when they say somebody has a reputation for something. And, um, but, you know, you, you never can tell, you, you give it your best effort and you just hope it's gonna come off right. And then you just, you know, you never know. You know, I've worked on shows that I thought were gonna be a huge hit and then they just weren't. And other shows that I worked on that I like, one of the first shows we worked on was Melrose Place. And I thought, oh, no one's gonna watch this show. And I was really wrong about that because that was a big hit in the nineties, you know? And so you're working in the entertainment industry where there are reviews for your work. And, you know, we probably all learned the hard way as F. Scott Fitzgerald did that not everybody's gonna like our work. How do you personally deal with reviews that are negative? Well, you know, some of the written ones, I, I'll read them and then I'll, I'll just either agree or disagree. Um, the one thing I don't do is I don't read um, what's written online. Now my partner will read everything that's written online about a show, but I will not because especially when people are anonymous, they'll, you know, there's no end to what they'll say. And when we did The Killing, for instance, um, the show was always, I don't know if any of you have seen that show, but the show was always um, designed so that the first two, you didn't find out who the murderer was until the end of the second season. And so when, and that's how the original Danish show was, and that's how we did the American version. And when the first season ended and the, we didn't know who the murderer was, the internet went insane. And um, people just said, you know, we didn't create the killing, Bina Sue did. Um, and people said horrible things about her, made racist comments about, you know, personal comments, which is what people can do on the internet. So I just avoid the internet completely. I don't really want to hear what people have to say on the internet. And then written reviews, you know, you just, you kind of hope for the best and pick yourself up if it's bad and just keep moving forward. You know, sometimes people don't get what you intended and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> There's actually a great quote that I love from F. Scott Fitzgerald, onward, votes against the current. And it, it really kind of exemplifies what you're talking about. We have a follow-up question about your comment about Christina Ricci. I don't know how much you want to go into this, but he'll ask, what do you mean Christina Ricci is not an easy person to work with? Oh, well, she's, she, you know, this was, um, like I said, she she was the one who optioned the book first, and then we came on and ended up to write it. And you know, I, I shouldn't say anything, but she's she's um, as she says, she's a person who's been supporting a family of seven since she was ten years old. So she is somebody who you know was a child star and a child actress, and has you know, and is she's a tough little person. And she wants things the way she wants it. And, um, you know, as a writer, you don't necessarily always agree with what it is she wants. So we, we, we had some, you know, banging of heads at some points. But ultimately, since she was an executive producer, too, we would all come together and find a solution to, you know, whatever the problem was. The, the most difficult thing that happened was that she didn't love the person, the first person we cast is Scott Fitzgerald. And so that person ended up being replaced after the pilot. And that, that, was, that was a difficult blow because she just was insistent on recasting, you know, and I'm not sure I agreed with that decision, but, you know, we just had to go with it. Is there a way we can see the pilot? Is that available at all anywhere online? The pilot is the first episode. So- Oh, it is the, oh, yeah, okay. So that's the first episode and, um, we actually, you know, like I said, the pilot ends with her meeting Scott. 
so the Scott that we had cast is only in like one or two brief scenes. And, um, but, you know, we ended up recasting and having to reshoot that, which is just what happens sometimes. Yeah. So, so then we have a question about historical periods, such as uh, New York in the 1920s, London during the Blitz. How do you meet audience expectations for sets, dress, and dialogue while creating the world you want? Well, you know, first of all, you have to have a lot of money to, <laughs> to do period. So this show, Z, was a very expensive show because of the period. And, you know, because we shot a lot of it, some of it in the studio, like you said, the Biltmore Hotel we built. And there's a house in Westport that we built, you know, um, in, on a soundstage. But we also, when we shot on the streets of New York, and we shot in Harlem, you then have to go do CGI work afterwards and you have to erase all the air conditioning vents and all the, you know, everything that's not from 1920 New York, you have to go through and have somebody um, who does special visual effects, you know, make it period appropriate. So that's all costs a lot of money. And um, in this case, Zelda, uh, Christina wore a mix of both vintage dresses and then some dresses they made for her, you know, which, um, but mostly vintage dresses that were just beautiful, you know, beautiful dresses that were very expensive. So that added to it. And, you know, and people have different bodies now than they did in 1920s. And those clothes were just brutal to wear. Those drop waist dresses in the 20s, that was a hard style to pull off. I think, I think Christina Ricci did a great job with it, but, but man, you know, it's hard. And, and um, I'm not sure about the audience expectation, but I guess we expect that it's, you know, you don't want people to say, oh, I saw, you know, uh, a Ford Taurus in the background of, you know, a scene that you shot in Manhattan, you know, in 1920. So you just try to be as careful as you can and, and hope that you don't ruin it for somebody. Yeah, that's really fascinating to hear. And there are some, I'm sure there are some people who are really avidly watching to make sure that it's historically correct. So that's unfortunately all the time we have for questions tonight. I have to say, I could easily talk to you for another hour. And I really wanna thank you, Nicole, for joining us to share your amazing experience is in television and your inside view into the hit series Z, The Beginning of Everything. It's been terrific to explore how you really bring these stories to life. Well, I want to thank also... you so much. You, you, you've been wonderful and, and the audience has been wonderful. Thank you for the great questions. And um, I've been so, I'm so thrilled to have been asked to come and, and be in front of all of you, so thank you. <laughs> Well, we're really thrilled to have you. And I also want to thank the Princeton Club of New York, the Princeton Association of New York City, Princeton Arts Alumni, Princeton Club of Southern California, and Princeton and Hollywood for co-sponsoring this program with us. It shows how popular you are that we were able to bring all these groups together <laughs> to partner on this program. And I really want to thank my fellow co-hosts Rob Wolf, Pilar Castro Kiltz, and Anna Zuckerman Vidovenko. And a big thank you to all of us who joined us this evening. The Princeton Club is recording this talk and we'll be sending everyone a link. We hope you'll join us for our other terrific upcoming programs, including a virtual museum tour I'll be hosting on January 13th of an amazing exhibition of Vietnamese art called Faces of Vietnam by art collector Stephen Humphreys. So despite the challenges of the moment, we're proud to bring you cultural programs like these that you can enjoy from the comfort of your living room. And thankfully, we now have a vaccine against COVID-19. Nicole, hopefully you'll get to travel to Israel in January to shoot your next hit series, Hit and Run, and I can't wait to see it. And we would really love to have you back to discuss that new Netflix series when it's ready. Thank you so much. I would love to. And happy holidays to everybody. And thank you. Thank you. Wendy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Warm wishes to everyone, including Nicole, for a healthy and happy holiday season and a wonderful new year. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Bye.